So with uh, no further presentation, we will have Giovanna Karanovic. Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here for the very first edition of Regional Reshaping Work event. Um, I will present to you uh, my study in progress um, now on platform cooperatives. Well, we all know that platforms are becoming a very important force in the society and uh, platforms like Uber, uh, Deliveroo, Upwork um, are really uh, growing with enormous speed with some of them being uh, worth a few billions of dollars. And what's mainly ascribed to the success of these platforms is their ability to grow by leveraging network effects. So the more users you have on one side of the platform, the more attractive is the platform for users on the other side. So more Uber drivers you have, the more is Uber attractive for passengers. And the way platforms are able to grow is by different price allocation mechanisms. So they will usually subsidize one side of the market in order to attract users on the other side. Um, so the logic, the predominant logic has been winner takes all. You need to get to the market, you know, need to grow very fast in order to capture it. And um, the way uh, platforms are doing this is by standardization. So if you notice the Uber app, for instance, which I suppose most of you are familiar with, whether you're using it in New York City or in Amsterdam, you will notice that it looks pretty much the same. So it has the uh, same uh, ar uh, platform architecture, it has the same rating system, and when Uber introduces a new policy, such as, for instance, a tipping policy, policy, you rolls it out across all countries in the world. So by being able to standardize their services, they're able to very easily launch and uh, capture any new market. But there are some trade-offs to this standardization. So namely, uh, preferences of users are heterogeneous. And we have seen examples of these companies failing in certain markets where their size did not matter as much. So for instance, Uber has lost to Grab in Asia and it has lost to Karim, the Saudi Arabian startup, which he later on acquired, simply because he was not familiar with the local culture. So in the case to, uh, with Karim, for instance, Uber did not realize that in Saudi Arabia, nobody uses credit cards, everybody uses cash. And Karim, which had much better knowledge of the local market, when it entered, he was familiar with the local culture and in this way was able to win over Uber. And Uber is now, by the way, in the process of acquiring Karim. So there are really strong trade-offs between focusing on platform size and growing fast and focusing on a very distinct identity and the knowledge of local culture. Um, so there are two primary dimensions of platform value, and that is platform size, or the strategies for the growth of network effects, and platform identity, and that is distinct value offering. And platforms can compete in the market if they differentiate themselves by different identity. And we see examples of that. So for instance, you have a dating website, eHarmony, that selects out. So it selects users based on um, certain social level, based on certain education level. So instead of saying, well, everybody is welcome, like Tinder, for instance, he actually selects out. It's offering very specific um, uh, identity appeal to users. Um, and one example where we are seeing this very strong platform identity or differentiation on identity versus size are platform cooperatives. Platform cooperatives are platforms like Uber, Deliveroo, and Upwork that are owned and governed by users, workers, or both. And we are seeing now this as a growing phenomenon around the world. And we can name over 100 now examples of platform cooperatives. And some prominent examples are Stocksy, it's a stock photography website uh, that's originating in Canada and that is owned by photographers. Uh, Stocksy select high quality photographers that also at the end of the year get dividends of the company. You have Partago, which is coming from Belgium. It is an electric car sharing platform cooperative that's owned by employees. Um, and 
as you can see, you know, with Soxy as well, focusing on really high quality in Partago, they always have some fair value offering, let's say. So Partago is saying we are sustainable, we are offering um, a fair sharing of car, we want to uh, be green, hence only electric cars are allowed and so on. Uh, we have Wohelpen, which is a Dutch platform economy uh, startup, and it is for care services, for informal care services, and it does not have monetary transactions. Um, and Fair BNB, it is a platform cooperative version of Airbnb that is owned by employees. And Fairbnb as well has some fair value offering. So for instance, Fairbnb has a rule, one host, one house, because they think it's unsustainable um, that five people in big cities like Paris, Amsterdam, or London uh, would own five houses, be making money of that, which is at the end, you know, rich getting richer. So they all have some distinct value offering. And uh, what we are interested in knowing is whether uh, how do platform cooperatives deal with these trade-off between platform size and platform identity? Because we know that at the end of the day, platform cooperatives also have to grow in size. They simply cannot compete in the market if they don't attract the other side of the market. But perhaps this identity can be a strong competitive advantage. And in order to find this out, we are taking four cases across four different industries. So the cases I presented to you uh, across four different industries. And uh, we are differentiating them based on network effects. So whether network effects are global or local. Because you can imagine that for a platform like uh, Upwork or Stocksy, the platform cooperative version, the overall size of the network matters a lot. So you care about the overall number of users on the network. Because if you want to hire a freelancer via platform, or if you want to buy a stock photo, you care about the size of the network. But when it comes to a cleaning platform, like Helplink, or platform cooperative version Up and Go, which is in New York City, you don't care about their overall network. You might just care about the number of users in your specific city or even in your neighborhood. And this is where platform cooperatives might have an advantage because they have this knowledge of the local culture, because they can appeal to the community. So we are differentiating differentia cases by the type of the network effects. Um, and I'm going to tell you now some initial insights, some initial findings that we have. But like I said, this study is still in progress. So, uh, one thing that we've seen is that identity definitely serves as a drive, strategy, and motivation for joining. When we speak to founders, we will hear that this has been the motivation to start the platform, that they want to offer a more uh, fair uh, value to its users, that they want to distribute profits more evenly, and so on. And we also hear that this is a motivation for users to join a platform cooperative to participate because they really believe in the model. So in this sense, uh, one founder of Partago that I spoke to, she told me it is very easy for us to get um, uh, the enthusiasts or uh, believers in this uh, uh, platform economy, uh, platform cooperative movement, uh, because once we show up in the market, these are your users that are already existing and they will come to you. Uh, but what's difficult for them to get is rational economic agents, if you will, people that uh, are really looking for um, what is the financial benefit for them uh, for joining such a platform. Um, so um, one problem that we see with platform cooperatives is definitely getting the venture capital to take off because they're simply not attractive uh, for investors. And this makes it very difficult for them to compete with platforms like Uber and Deliveroo because they simply do not have enough funds to invest in the price allocation mechanisms, so for driving the price down in order to attract users. Um, and we also see that type of network effects matters. Um, so global uh, versus local network effects. Uh, there is a different strategies to control the openness of the market. Um, so uh, where network effects are local, what I gave in examples with, for instance, a food delivery platform or a cleaning platform, um, the 
strong identity eliminates the need for strong membership selection mechanisms. So the platform is very familiar to users and there is no need to ward off members to say, well, you don't comply to our identity, um, you don't believe in our model. They will come to them simply if they believe in the model. So it is much easier to enforce identity uh, in this case. Whereas, where the uh, network effects are global, they will make sure that the selection mechanisms are enforced at the very beginning. Uh, so for instance, with Airbnb, which is the version like Airbnb, you don't care about the number of houses in Barcelona, right? Because you are not traveling to Barcelona, you care about the overall number of offerings. So in this case, the platform will introduce mechanisms at the very beginning, such as for instance, one host, one house policy, because they need to control the entry at the very beginning. After that, it simply spreads. Whereas, like we said, with the local network effects, they can afford this identity all along because they're operating in the community, which is very much familiar with uh, what they do. So essentially what we are trying to do is to map these mechanisms of how platform cooperatives can compete in a market, which can also be of use to platform capitalist firms, uh, if you will. Um, so some of the differentiation strategies that uh, platforms that operate on local network effects are using is strong identity uh, uh, enforcement and market segment uh, specialization. And uh, some of the global network effects is restrictive market entry. And they're also trying to make the platform architecture as such uh, that uh, supports uh, this identity. Um, so for instance, uh, sustainability will be a big driver will signal uh, this strong identity. Um, so some of the contributions uh, that we are making with this study is to the strategy literature uh, by uh, calling for, which has called for better understanding of digital strategies. Um, and we are proposing an alternative to the get big fast logic. Um, so it is not just about winner takes all. It's not about uh, growing uh, your platform to the enormous size, but it is also about having differentiation strategy and a strong identity identity appeal, which platform cooperatives are an example for. Uh, we are also contributing to the literature of new organizational forms by presenting platform cooperatives as yet another uh, model. And my personal opinion is that perhaps platform cooperatives will not become mainstream. Uh, most surely they will not become a mainstream, but they are um, showing us that there are alternatives to what we currently have. And platform cooperatives are one model, but we are also seeing models that are emerging uh, on blockchain uh, or uh, various new technologies. And I think that is what we're going to see more in the coming years. We will see many different models uh, of platforms emerging. Um, and of course, we are contributing to the platform economy literature more generally, as there is no extensive study to this moment uh, that is uh, um, uh, giving a narrative basically of platform cooperatives and what they're about, main challenges, and how they can overcome them. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Giovanna. We have the second uh, speaker presenter presenting uh, today, Ricardo Speld from the Demon Research Group. As mentioned before, this is a cross-country cross, cross -country study on platform careers, perceptions on societal and labor impacts. Huh? So, thank you, Ricardo, for being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this research. Uh, in this case, our, this research is performed by Mayo Fuste, uh, Melissa Renaud, that it's here, and then uh, she's going to present a master thesis, uh, really interesting, as uh, David mentioned before. Uh, and finally, me uh, as a senior researcher of, of the group. Uh, this research is, is part of a broader research. Uh, on the one side, uh, last year uh, in Barcelona, uh, there, there was a meeting from 40, more than 40 cities uh, around the world in order to discuss about what is the platform economy impacting their cities and how to manage that and how to create a common vision about that. This is the result of the, the meeting 
was a declaration of a common principles of the cities in order to try to discuss and to work, indeed, in the work, it's very important, it's not only to discuss, it's, all, it's also to try to work to, uh, to implement some of the strategies and some politicals in order to change the, the impact or to uh, try to reconfigure a better approach to platform economy. These two principles are from the type of uh, labor uh, issues. On the one side is to take advantage about the, the platform economy to engage people, to try to, uh, as maybe sometimes as, uh, as uh, uh, Giovanna said, uh, to also to try to transform the cooperatives. Him is especially important because there is a big tradition about cooperatives uh, and how to transform this type of cooperative in platform uh, uh, cooperatives. Uh, on the other side is the idea to uh, uh, reinforce. Here, yeah, it's better. Okay, sorry. It's uh, only a question of to be a refugee for a research point of view. Uh, in any case, um, can I visit? Okay. Uh, the other side, the other, the other approach of labor uh, things is about. Uh, how to regulate uh, this impact and how to manage the situation of sometimes uh, unfair situation of uh, platform labor workers. Uh, well, the research questions. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, the, the the other the other approach to this uh, broader research is about plus project. It's a plus project. Is a. a uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project that uh, is focused on the on the impact of platform labor has in urban spaces. Uh, it's a transnational project that it's uh, carried on Barcelona, Bologna, Berlin, uh, Lisbon, London, Paris, Italy. And one of the pilots of the project is, for example, Airbnb, that it's trying to reinforce the conditions of, uh, of platform labors in the current uh, main platforms, but at the same time is trying to challenge of this vision of how to increase the number of platform cops. Uh, uh, the research questions in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, the thing that we try to define something that it's uh, a very common uh, uh, debate during these days about what are the platform couriers, what are their profile, what are their nationality, motivation, these type of things. Then to speak about the labor conditions, about these couriers. And finally, and this is something that it's related to, to our job as a, a research group, what is the role of uh, public administration? Uh, we, 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 we discovered two lacks uh, of research in this field. Sometimes the, most of the articles created around platform labor is about uh, case, uh, uh, cases, cases uh, uh, um, very concrete. It's sometimes difficult to find uh, uh, a type of research that is interdisciplinary of different cases and, and sometimes uh, there are not, uh, um, there is not uh, 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 a transnational approach, it's more focused on uh, in a specific countries and we try to create a transnational approach in, in, in this case. Well, the research goals connected to the research questions are to, put, to, study the, to define the characterization of the platform couriers, their working conditions, and try, this is, I think, the most interesting part, to define the role of civic society, the research, the public administration. Our quadruple approach, uh, quadruple helix approach is uh, quite significant in order to co-create public policies, and this is what is, uh, I think, the main part of uh, this research. Uh, uh, we, uh, we took advantage about uh, a meeting that it was held in Barcelona uh, this uh, April uh, where some uh, platform couriers around the world meet in Barcelona in order to discuss and to create and a space, I think, also to create a group of task force in order to reinforce the, the capacity to transform their situation of labor uh, altogether. Uh, and also, uh, we also focus on, on Barcelona and how is managing this type of uh, action 
uh, from the public policies and we uh, we did uh, six interviews to the different actors uh, take into account uh, the the whole profiles um, well these are some conclusions that are very common during these days uh, we are sp uh, speaking about an activity that is largely male dominated uh, with a lot uh, uh, about immigrant communities overrepresented, it's it's quite important to say that uh, the different uh, the different countries have different type of approximations about social demographic structure about platform uh, uh, couriers. But some of these uh, ap approaches are very common. It's quite clear that there are two main profiles, a student that uh, wants to earn something complementary incomes uh, regarding to their activity as uh, platform riders. At the same time, uh, a lot of people that are in, in risk because they have a long periods of employment uh, or, or sometimes in, uh, even with a not uh, legal uh, um, requirements complete to get into the labor market. Uh, uh, we differentiate two stage uh, in, in terms of social demographic characteristics, as uh, you can read. First, a large represent of studies when, when the, 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 uh, the possibility to earn a complementary income lows, uh, then they start to decrease and to change the, the, the way that they get this uh, uh, extra air money. Uh, the second stage is represented by immigrant people. Some of them don't uh, undocumented, as I said. Um, regarding to the, this is I need my notes. Sorry. Uh, regarding to this map, uh, as uh, we can see in this map, uh, the employment statu the status uh, in all the cities were considered self-employment. Uh, except from Berlin, where uh, are considered uh, employees. In spite of that, when we uh, speak with uh, uh, a courier from Munich, uh, I, I think I said Berlin, but it's Munich, uh, 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 he highlights that the, mon the, the platform it is uh, the, the type of uh, regular. Uh, considering as employees, uh, has contributed to monopolization of the sector and uh, still considers uh, his job conditions as unfair. That it's something that uh, we make think as about. If maybe it's not enough uh, to to be discussed if we are uh, 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 speaking about self employees or not. Uh, in spite there are different uh, visions about uh, about their uh, labor conditions, uh, we take some uh, common uh, issues about or some common measures uh, from the different riders participants in our research. Uh, taking into consideration that they don't want to challenge the definition as a self-employed workforce, they, they are requesting for a better cycling infrastructure, uh, an increasing of uh, uh, earns, demanding data to be transparent. This is something that is quite uh, 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 important in, in a society and in a space where the data is uh, increasing their value. And finally, last, uh, sometimes some couriers are, are asking for a different type of platforms, uh, like uh, Giovanna present as a, a platform cops. Uh, challenging their definition as a self-employing workforce, uh, they, they request for a better health issues, making riders not able to work as many hours they want, uh, shorting juridical timings, asking for a reclassification of workers as employees, and social protections, improvements related to their juridical recognition as employees. Um, uh, related to the working conditions, we have uh, two main groups. One of them related to the employment legal status. As you can see, uh, they, they, they request for a better labor protections. To, to reinforce the, the insurance that they are regarding their activity, that it's sometimes very aggressive because they, uh, they, they suffer from robberies, aggressive confrontations, and this type of things that you can read in the, in the screen. 
Uh, this is something that it's uh, quite transversal, I think, in the platform economy, that it's the, the, the difficulty to create a collective bargaining, uh, to discuss, to concentrate. Yesterday, uh, uh, during the, the dinner, I was speaking with uh, uh, somebody who is going to participate in the in the caring session this afternoon that I think it will be amazing this uh, debate and this is something that it's not in the media but it's uh, in our life it's it's in it's it's very sensitive of our society that it's something it's uh, sometimes it's a uh, uh, the ghost part of the platform economy uh, the the other thing that uh, they relate uh, to the employment legal status is about the cost of materials needed to perform the job. Related to the role of digital to uh, technologies, that as we mentioned, the light of transparency of data, the, cities, the, the, the system that promotes the, this competition uh, among couriers, and the, the, the ponderation system that favors that uh, the people don't have a real flexibility. This is something that we, we take from our research. Maybe it's something that we need to discuss and, and maybe we could uh, discuss this. Um, finally, uh, uh, we want to uh, highlight uh, about the different uh, interviews that uh, we held uh, in Barcelona about uh, proposals that the experts uh, promote. There are some proposals that are in common, that the multi-governance is needed, that there is not a collaboration between different levels of public administration, that it's something that is really important, but sometimes the competence is not uh, from the city side, and uh, in spite of that, the impact of the platform labor impacts really in the urban spaces. Uh, the need for introduction of participatory policy making process in designing public policies, that is something that is really connected to our approach of research. And finally, uh, positive opinions regarding possible universal basic income proposals. Uh, maybe uh, Melissa will uh, explain better before uh, connected uh, with her research. In this agreement, there are some stakeholders that think the platform couriers uh, should be recognized as employees while others uh, do not. Uh, some proposals, uh, replaying in Spain the sandbox system of uh, United Kingdom that uh, allows live time-bound testing of innovations and the regulations of our, of our site. Also, the promotion of platform cooperatives, as uh, uh, we said before, the restriction of companies uh, of local license to certain requirements, environmental sustainability, fair working conditions, etc. Agreements at a supranational level in order to establish a common framework include the current labor regulations, uh, new indications of labor, elimination of the flat rate for the self-employed workers, and finally the coordination between cities in order to increase bargaining power in front of private insets. This is something that is really important uh, in, in the side of uh, political action, I think. This is some of uh, the main conclusions of our research. Uh, I don't know if I, I have enough time because uh, I forgot. One minute, okay. Uh, indeed, you have uh, here the description of our conclusions. Uh, I, uh, some, some, some questions asked in order to uh, follow then the debate. Uh, some, this is, uh, I think, is something that it's really interesting uh, how some couriers uh, want to reinforce their the rights and this is something really connected to the plus vision no how to reinforce the charter of rights how to create a new type of relation about uh, uh, lay, uh, platform labors and and uh, and the platforms to the other side the creation of new types of uh, of uh, structures more connected to the platform comp and a lot of challenge that uh, Giovanna mentioned before that this type of models have in order to scale, to, to get the connection in each city, uh, even we are speaking uh, uh, in, a, in a global context. Okay, and finally, uh, as you know, this is, a, this is a broader research that we are managing in order to diffuse uh, to expansion the, the different type of model that there are um, beyond the, the platform economy. Uh, we, this year we are going to create a big debate about labor uh, linked to the PLUS project. 
Uh, this is, today is the last date uh, for proposals, but you are invited to participate. And if you have a, a very special proposal you, and you want to present there, please let me know and we try to, to meet there. Thank you. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo Speld. Just to continue picking a bit your brain, there were connections with the previous presentation, as, as you saw, on platform cooperativism, but there are ideas here presented that regard or basically imply discussions on public policies, on precariousness, on even legal aspects that uh, are connected to, to his presentation, particularly the role of transparency, uh, data portability. So here, I mean, at least myself, I, I collected a few ideas that could be later on transformed into questions, and I invite you to do the same. So now we have uh, Anna Ginez, who's the, the director of the Institute for Labor Studies, a colleague of mine, and doing a, what to me is a very interesting research on algorithms and classification of workers. So thank you, Anna. You have 15 minutes. And the pointer, you have it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much um, to the organizers of this amazing conference for having or allowing me to present um, my paper, which is called Algorithms as Subordination. Um, and this is part of a research project um, called um, Labor Algorithm, which is to analyze the impact of algorithms in the labor relationship. Um, so, I'd like to start my presentation with this quote by uh, Lucas Biewold. Uh, founder of Crowdflower, maybe you already know it, um, but it says, before the internet, it would be really difficult to find someone, sit them down for 10 minutes, and get them to work for you, uh, and then fire them after those 10 minutes. But with technology, you can actually find them, pay them a tiny amount of money, and then get rid of them when you don't need them anymore. So this quote um, is actually unpleasantly accurate of how platform uh, works, uh, how digital platforms they work. Um, they treat workers as a commodity, as an endless source of labor, um, like if opening a tap, uh, like if it were opening a tap, as you can see illustrated here in this cover of The, the Economist. But I also like the quote um, because it shows the importance of technology, because without internet, without technology, this would not be possible. Okay. Um, so very briefly, although this is very common, or, or there, this is is very known for everyone, but how is this singular business model based on? Essentially for key elements. First is the division of tasks or services in micro tasks, so very individual short term, uh, term task. Second, each and every one of these tasks is outsourced to a very large number of workers, and it has to be very large so as the so that, that the platform can have enough supply to cover demand that there is at all times in the platform. So if I wake up at 3 a.m. and I want some ice cream, there has to be someone connected at the platform to cover my demand, okay? And this is why the, the, the new term of crowdsourcing, because it's outsourcing to a large crowd of workers. Then, the third element of this business model is hiring on demand. So basically, um, workers are hired at the precise moment when there's the petition for a service. And this is, again, thanks to technology, because new gen generation technology allows us to determine the exact and precise moment where a service um, is requested. And with the use of an algorithm, in a question of seconds, this uh, service, this request, can be assigned to a person uh, willing to carry it, it out. And finally, this business model is based on um, independent contractors. So instead of providing the service internally, they have outsourced it completely to people that are formally considered independent contractors or self-employed workers. Um, as um, it has been mentioned uh, multiple times throughout the conference, there's a very important uh, legal and social conflict regarding the legal status of platform workers. And we find contradictory decisions in almost any country in the world. So in the United States, in the UK, in France, in Italy, and Spain is, is also the case. You have here listed some of the different decisions in different cities, uh, administrative and judicial decisions, both uh, in both both senses. Some declare that there's a labor relationship, others declare that there's a self-employment relationship. 
Okay? So at first glance, it might seem that platform workers don't fit in the traditional definition of worker. Um, and this is true because technology has introduced new elements of flexibility. So it's not only a question about um, that platform workers use their their means of production, or that they bear the costs of the activity, or that they receive retribution directly proportionate to the number of services they provide. It's that technology has introduced two new elements of flexibility that we didn't have before, okay? Or at least not as um, apparent as, as in platform economy. And first is the freedom to work. So they are free, from a legal perspective, to determine when they work. But not only to determine their schedule, but to determine how many hours they work and if they work at all. And second, the capacity to reject work. So the capacity to decide which services, which requests they take on and which they don't. Okay? Additionally, platform, digital platforms have added a new and sophisticated narrative that generates more confusion. So we don't talk about workers anymore, we talk about uh, writers, we don't talk about jobs, we talk about, about gigs, and customers are peers. So this generates a lot of confusion that is allowing platforms to exploit this um, regulatory arbitrage. So to exploit this confusion, this legal confusion generated by this, this new reality. Okay. Um, however, in my opinion, if we look at the characteristics of platforms uh, more in detail, we find other characteristics or other, other elements that, in my opinion, um, um, allows us to consider them as, as workers, as employees. And here we find the role of algorithms, the role of the platform and the app, itself, and then the absence of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial opportunities. So let's go with the first one. What is the role of algorithms in the classification of workers uh, in the platform economy? So algorithms, in my opinion, have two very important um, effects. First, they allow us, in my opinion, to differentiate between technological firms and service providers. So um, a lot of digital platforms, what they do is that they argue that they don't provide the service. Rather, they are a technological firm that has developed a software and allows for the free um, connection between users in the platform. So some platforms, they argue that they are mere intermediator, uh, in, they intermediate between uh, supply and demand, okay? However, in my opinion, algorithms, the use of algorithms in matching supply and demand is crucial to determine whether platforms are acting or not as mere technological firms or if they're acting as service providers. So the use of an algorithm to match supply and demand to assign through an algorithm that takes into account different metrics, the use of an algorithm to assign services to different um, workers, in my opinion, that is a clear indication that they are service providers because they are intervening in the service. They're not just allowing free interactions between supply and demand within the platform. They're not just creating a free marketplace because they're intervening in the assignment of these services. And this is a little bit in line with the decision of the ECJ regarding uh, Uber, uh, where it says that the intermediation services provided by Uber was inherently linked to the transportation services. So this use of an algorithm in the intermediation is linked to the service, uh, to the provision of the service. The second, um, the second um, impact that algorithms have is that they are um, act as forms of subordination. So all of the geolocation systems that um, um, platform workers use in the app, that generates a massive amount of data that platforms can use. So platforms know exactly where our workers are at all times, uh, how many hours uh, that day, that week, the previous months, the previous six months they have connected to the platform, how many times they connected during high demand hours or high demand periods, how many services did they accept, how many did they reject. So they know, know all about the worker's activity. And all of this information is processed and is integrated in sophistic 
sophisticated algorithms to adopt organizational decisions. So it depends on the, t on the platform. So every platform has its own singularities. Um, however, the use of algorithms taking into account the platform's organizational metrics, that's a form of subordination. And it's a form of subordination because, first, it's very effective. It actually is a very effective way to manage and organize the workforce. But, in spite of it being effective or not, it's still a form of organization. And this is typical of the labor relationship. Third, technology is also relevant because the technology used by digital platforms is actually the essential and nuclear um, infrastructure. So platforms, they argue that they are not service providers because they don't own the bicycles or cars or computers or phones that workers are using. But this is, in my opinion, irrelevant because the essential infrastructure is not these cars and bikes and phones and computers, but it's the app itself. It's the platform because this is what allows the business model and the business carried out by platforms. And again, this is um, what the ECJ concluded in its decisions, the two decisions regarding Uber. It says the company provides an application without which those drivers would not be led to provide transport services and persons who wish to make an urban journey would not use the services provided by those drivers. So the app is essentially because it was what, it's essential because it is what allows this interaction. And finally, in my opinion, um, the third um, argument to consider workers as employees is the absence of entrepreneurial opportunities. So it is the platform, the one that's adopting all business, economic, and strategic decisions. Workers don't have any capacity to determine conditions, to determine prices, to determine uh, markets, which markets um, the platform is in and which it's not. Commercial contracts with uh, companies, they have no capacity to determine all of this that influences a business. So, uh, oh, sorry, and in, in addition, um, they have the prohibition to pursue any business opportunity that they achieved within the platform. So if within the platform a worker um, establishes contact with a company, it is absolutely prohibited that they continue this relationship outside the platform. Okay? And they are providing services within or under the platform's brand. So besides working more hours, platform workers have no capacity to adopt any decision that influence their supposed business, because this is all adopted by the platform. Okay? Additionally, and this is something that uh, Ricard mentioned, um, what is generating um, precarity uh, regarding platform workers, it's not only the definition or the legal status of platform workers, but it's the, on the hiring on demand itself. Platform workers are essentially using the zero hour contract, which by the way is illegal, at least in Spain and in other countries uh, in Europe. Because workers, they don't have any guarantee of working time. They're only hired when there is a demand, and if there is no demand, they're not hired. As a result, their work and their salary is absolutely unpredictable, okay? This is leading to what uh, scholars uh, started to call algorithmic instability, because their access to work and hence salary is variable on the algorithm adopted and controlled by the platform, which can be changed, and it, it actually happens that platforms, they change the algorithm, okay? This leads to an extreme labor instability present because their present salaries depend on this demand and also future because this will affect future pensions. Okay? So basically this model implies a shift and it's shifting the risk, the typical business risk to workers. They are the ones bearing the risk of um, absence of demand, of inactivity periods or even malfunctioning. Of the, of the platform, okay? And this re uh, creates a risk of exploitation because workers, they are forced to work very long hours in anti-social um, schedules and in absolutely adverse um, 
weather conditions to make ends meet. And this is especially true for platform workers because since the business model is based on an oversupply of workers, it means that there is more competition in the platform. So it's, it, it's actually harder to, to access work. So given this scenario, is, there, is it possible to have like a harmony between platforms and workers' interests? Basically, we have four solutions. First solution would be to create the figure of the independent worker. And this has been um, defended by different authors, uh, Harrison Kruger and in Spain, Jesus Mercader Ugina and Salvador del Rey. Um, so it's basically establishing a specific regulation like the one happened in, in France, the one adopted in France, and recognizing them um, some minimum rights, essentially equality, non-discrimination, training, health and safety, uh, and collective bargaining, for example. Second solution would be the one defended by Adrián Tolodi, Tolodi, a scholar uh, in Spain, which is to create a special labor relationship. So protect them under the labor relationship, but to have a singular and specific legal regime. The question is, is will this imply recognizing the zero hour contract? And are we willing to do so? The third option has been analyzed by Ricard, and it's to promote, uh, and, for, and by Joanna as well, is to promote workers' um, cooperatives. Um, and this has, platform uh, co-ops have um, increased in the, in the past years. We have in Spain two important examples, the case of Mensacas in Barcelona or uh, La Pajara in, in Madrid. And finally, the last option, um, sometimes qualified as utopian or unrealistic or just not being present in this world is um, to insist that there's a labor relationship and demand platforms to comply with current labor regulation. Um, this has been defended by myself, Valerio De Stefano, Ignacio Baltan, or Jer Jeremiah Sprassel. Um, in my opinion, the definition of worker is still valid nowadays and platform work fits within this traditional definition of worker. It's true that there maybe will have to have some specific readjustments, okay? But it's not necessary to adapt the entire labor regulation to a business model that's based specifically on eluding this labor regulation. So in my opinion, the definition of worker is still valid in spite of having to identify new elements of this definition of worker. What are these new elements? elements? The importance of algorithmic management as a form of management proper of the labor relationship, the importance of technology as the infrastructure, and the absence of any entrepreneurial opportunities as also relevant in the definition uh, of worker. Um, platforms, they can create and will create economic, social, and even, even labor benefits. But for us to be able to see all of these benefits and for all of these benefits to be for everyone, um, my opinion is that they have to comply with current regulation, um, tax regulation, labor regulation, and any other type of, of regulation that we have in, in place because it is actually still valid. And I don't think it's an option to adapt it to specific business interests. So thank you very much for your attention. We have the last speaker for today in this panel, um, who is Melissa Renau. She belongs to the same Demons uh, research group, working on another hot topic, uh, as uh, mentioned before, which is that of the universal basic income and the basically transformations that it could bring about to the work uh, capital relations. Thanks a lot for being here. Okay, um, so first of all, Hi to all of you. Um, as Ricard said, I'm a PhD candidate in the Demos Research Group, and I'm working in two projects, in the PLAS project and also in the Sharing Cities Action project. Um, so well, I'm going to present you my master thesis, well, a part of my master thesis, which consisted on a business model analysis of global delivery. Um, I analyzed the, the, the implications of, of following a strategy, a strategy of cost-lowering um, formulas. In, in social terms. 
And afterwards, I, I went further from this. So I, I linked it to the neoliberal context, to the socioeconomical context that we are facing today, and also about the future of work and its safety net models. And this is what I'm going to present you today. It's exactly, um, I'm going to offer you a way of analyzing universal basic income in, from the perspective side of the workers. So basically, um, why we have to talk about universal basic income in the platform economy, we, s we saw it yesterday. Um, the platform economy gathers the key opportunities and challenges of the future of work, but also we have like major trends that are like um, putting us towards rethinking or social protection models. Basically, inequality is increasing, the labor patterns are, are changing, it's more unstable, it's more precarious also, and we see that conventional employment is decreasing well, at the same time, we see that um, production is still, it, it increases, but it's not distributed to everyone, the benefits of it. So, here in Europe, we, f we see that um, traditional social protections are still attached to traditional employment, and universal basic income offers us the opportunity of detaching this from, from the, the, the feeling of being an, an employee or being recognized as an employee and start thinking about the, just having the right of having a protection because being a, a, a citizen or a resident or because being a human. Um, why we have to think about unconditional policies? Basically because conditional policies fail to, to answer the to, to respond to the problem, at least partially. They stigmatize its potential recipients, they create poverty traps, and also they imply a high bureaucratic burden. But um, when we talk about universal basic income, and especially when we talk about universal basic income in the platform economy, no one talks about the different schemes that we can find with universal basic income and the different impacts that each, um, each of these schemes has. That's why I decided to develop an analytical model to help us think about the, the different types that we can promote. Um, this model is based, based on two previous, previously developed models, which is the Hitcherman's triangle. Hitcherman's basically explained that when there is a conflict social relationship, so when one of the parts is not satisfied, there are three options that can happen, or a combination of them. Basically, you can, let, you can raise your voice and try to change the relationship, or you can exit. You can, you can try to find another solution, another, another job opportunity. And in these two, two, two options, loyalty um, in the sense of, of um, cultural beliefs, in, in, the, in the sense of things that make you prevent from taking this, this from raising your voice or from taking other options, um, apply. So, for example, thinking that you uh, have to work 40, 40 hours per week, that you have to deliver a thousand, a thousand deliveries, and if you don't do it, you are not enough productive, and you don't fulfill with the requirements of society, this affects you from, from raising your voice. And I combine this with the Wilnamon and Wispelar models, which basically try to differentiate the different exit options. So they, they explain that there, there can be an option of an incomplete exit, which is I raise my voice um, and I get, and, and I get the, the opportunity, for example, to leave temporarily the labor market, but then I come back. I get better conditions, I get a raise in, a raise in salaries. Um, and stronger exits, which will call for this, those options when you go to, to work for another company, you move from, from a bet, to a better sector, better paid, um, you have more flexible uh, working arrangements, and the radical exit, which will call when you, for those options when you break completely with the hegemonic model. Um, so you start, for example, uh, working for a you you found a cooperative, you start being an entrepreneur, you dedicate time for caring, act caring activities, you take care of your children, etc. Um, what is important to take into account here is that voice and exit options are positively correlated. It, what does it mean? That in, in, even if I don't take the exit option, even if I don't go to, to start an entrepreneurial activity, even if I don't go to take care of my children, the fact of being able to say that I am able to do this increases my options of getting better job conditions. So, um, my, my model basically says, okay, um, there are two options where there is a conflict social relationships. It can happen that the, the person tries to change, the agent tries to change it or not. And this will depend on, on endogenous variables and an, 
on material and immaterial variables that, that, that affect the agent. For example, it can affect the fact that you are a woman and you, you, you normally are destined to care activities, it, but it can also affect, um, for example, the fact that you have certain education, the fact of, of having an alternative job offer, etc. And this will affect also the rest of outcomes in the, in the flowchart. For example, taking a, I don't consider the difference between the other models and, and my model is that I don't consider the incomplete exit as an exit. I consider that it's, you're still in the hegemonic model, so you're not, you're not getting a change. You are still dependent on the employer, so you, you are not really um, changing your situation. Um, and the other one, I, I, so basically, I, uh, differences between those that aim at changing the model and make, make a change in, in, the, in the hegemonic model and those that don't. Um, in my work, I apply this model to the case of platform careers, but I think that here it's more interesting to link it broadly to the platform economy and also to precarious workers because it's not just related to the platform economy. Um, will more people go for the try option with a universal basic income? Well, this depends on endogenous variables, so what we consider as, an, as a universal basic income, basically the main definition of, of, of universal basic income, what is basic, what is universal, um, and how much income do, are we going to do it, no? how, how much income are we going to deliver to them, and also um, what policies are going to go with, hand in hand with, with universal basic income, is it, is, is it going to sub, a substitute of the welfare state or is it not going to be? Um, and also exogenous variables to universal basic income, right? like as I said, the policies, the gender, etc. Um, here, it's important to, to, to clarify that there are different types of precarious workers, and each precarious worker faces different risks and faces different kinds of low remuneration, so this will have different impacts in, in each worker. Um, and we have to take into account, even in the case of careers, there are different types of platform careers. Not all of them face the same level of precariousness. What's, what is the first option? The first option is not, not trying it or stop raising their voice. Um, this will happen when they, they feel that they have no real options of getting better options. And this seems like too logical, and, but it's, it's important to, to talk about it because um, when it's more probably that this happens? It is more probably when people are not accompanied but by an emancipatory basic income, which means that in, that they cannot threaten with a credible exit option. So this, in the case, for example, of being a high, scale, high remunerated employee, you normally are well fitted in the labor market, so you can find for alternative labor, for, alter, for alternative job options. But in the case of a platform career, um, maybe you don't have that many options. So um, this, this could make that if we introduce a universal basic income of really a low amount, we can make that um, the, the highest, the, 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 the less precarious workers or those that are like have better labor job conditions, like in the sense that they can get better options or they can find an alternative, um, they, there's the, 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 the option that they get better conditions, but at the expense of the other ones. Why? Because let's imagine, and I have research behind this, um, that a platform career um, gets uh, 2,000 euros per month um, as a universal basic income. Okay, what's the main feeling? It's thanks, I'm going to cover basically the taxes in order to continue with my activity as a platform career. And this is perfect for, 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 for profit companies since we are helping them to, to continue with their business model. But this, we have to take into account that will contribute to the precarization of the economy. Um, so what do we have to do? Or we could think about it. It's offering um, to, to the maximum amount of workers as possible the option of, of having a threat, a credible threat. To, to, uh, and this will happen first when they have an alternative, an alternative job offer in the first case. So when, but this, as we know, it, it will not happen for all the workers. Or there is also the option that they can, they can threaten by taking to take the, the radical exit option and break with the model. Um, and this, happen, this will happen when they have enough for living. So when they have a, a highly 
universal basic income scheme, or they have a high, high payment, sorry, um, and this comes with also with complementary policies and education and also regulation also. Um, in this case, when they are they, they make it to, to threaten the employee and the employer um, credibly, the, the contracted the, the employer will have to make a cost benefit analysis. In this case, it can be the case that they find correctly they find, they find profitable to increase the, the working condition of the workers, but it, it can also be the other way around and they, they think, okay, let's automate the process. Let's use robots. Um, in this case, universal basic income could be um, criticized by catalyzing um, this, the, the, this process, no, by, 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 by being a catalyst um, in this maybe un unavoidable process. Um, so what's imp th that this is why I'm defending that it's really important to differentiate between basic income schemes and with, because we have to differentiate if it's really it's acting as a financial backstop for workers or if it's not. If, if we are really um, empowering them in the sense of, of, of offering them an alternative even for those that don't have it in the job market or not. Um, so yeah, basically these are like my preliminary conclusions that, um, that the potential of universal basic income depends on endogenous and exogenous variables. That's also providing economic independence. That's not mean ensuring equality. It will affect differently. So we can provide the same amount of income, but this is, will not have um, the same influx for, every, for, for everyone. And uh, I, I, I invite you to, to think about what, why do we want to think as a, understand as innovation. It's always competing through a cost-lowering formula and, in, and innovation. If we are avoiding em, em, employee um, rights, are we really innovating? And also, like, what does it mean flexibility? Who is, for who is this flexibility really? And well, and I also like, um, I think that we, we should think about the, the impacts of universal basic income in other vulnerable groups and test pilot schemes. So that's all, thank you. Uh, I would invite the four speakers to come up here just to, to face the grilling of the audience. Okay. Uh, I have collected a few questions at the same time, but uh, so that we could do it in a bit of a more interactive manner. If you agree on this, uh, I would put aside the, these cards and uh, if you like this idea, we will simply go with the traditional raise your hand. I pass the mic, and then you launch the, the question. Huh? Um, but anyway, since, since you might be still thinking on a few questions, I would like to start with, uh, with an initial one, or two, if no one uh, wants to, or still thinks on the question. The first one would be for, for Giovanna, since she, she mentioned the potential, but at the, the same time, uh, the potential, but at the same time, the drawbacks for uh, platform cooperatives to escalate. Eh? And she was very clear, network effects are based on the idea that you need a big mass of, uh, of uh, consumers, raiders, workers, etc. But at the same time, cooperatives have this limitation. They don't have this capacity to, to access big, big markets. Eh? So apparently here we have a serious problem if we want to escalate platform cooperative, but at the same time we go to, we leave aside the digital economy and we look at what is happening around uh, here in the case of Catalonia, we have Wi-Fi net with hundreds of thousands of, of people that are connecting, sharing the internet. Huh? So my question would be, and I, I address you Giovanna, but it is an invitation for all of you scholars because you are working on similar fields, to think about this, how, how can we, or can we really overcome this problem of size growth in a digital economy where uh, capital seems to be determining the success of an initiative like this or not, or you're a bit more pessimistic? Yeah, so um, some examples where I've seen them exploring alternative funding is uh, crowdfunding. So with, um, with their idea, okay, if this is something for all for the society, society might as well um, invest. That's what Airbnb did. They launched the crowdfunding campaign. And another example that I've seen that I'm really fond of 
is uh, what Partago did. Uh, what they did is they realized they simply cannot compete with capitalist firms. And they partner up with five other cooperatives and they founded Mobility Factory, which is a cooperative of cooperatives, uh, if you will. And what they did is they, in partnership with the Barcelona startup, Sa Mobilitat, I don't know if, yes. if they're present okay. here, um, they sold their algorithm to this joint cooperative mobility factory. And imagine a company like Uber would never do that. Their algorithm is their main asset. But what they realized is that instead of reinventing the wheel, they can um, give up the ownership of this algorithm. And any platform cooperative that wants to start, they don't need to reinvent the wheel. They can simply change uh, the front end. So back end is still the same for all of them. They just ch change uh, the front end of the platform. Um, and uh, this seems to be working quite well. So that is an example, uh, for instance, what these uh, uh, platforms could do. They could actually save uh, costs in the long run by partnering, partnering up with other cooperatives and finding these uh, umbrella organizations. I, I want to point, uh, to point out about uh, the case of Gifinet because it's uh, some controversial nowadays because, uh, as you know, some of the part is more about non-profit uh, approach uh, as an uh, NGO. At the same time, some business with a profit uh, activity are taking the I take in advantage of this model and they want to uh, get the governance of the organization and this is something that it's quite uh, interesting because maybe some organization that uh, born uh, with a horizontal structure and non-profit approach finally has been dominated by a, a profit approach of some of the business that control finally the, the, the model. Uh, we have been working in studying the different types of, uh, of um, fundings about this type of uh, alternative uh, platforms. Uh, on, on the one side, we have discovered that the model of traditional, no, the traditional, the main platforms like uh, Deliveroo, Deliveroo, Uber, and this type of uh, venture capital is not uh, possible for this type of projects. The type of uh, crowdfunding are really interesting and, uh, and I think it's the model that this type of projects could get sources in order to get their sustainability. The other thing is, uh, and connected to, to this uh, crowdfunding model, is how to will be the role of public administration. And this is, for example, that uh, cases like um, the campaign promoted by the City Council of Barcelona with a match funding uh, model where the city council provides uh, sources to get uh, to give to the, more, the projects that get more interest in the community. It's a good, I think, it's a good model in order to reinvent the, the model that this money that these projects get money from their community, but also um, from the public administration, because public administration thinks that these projects uh, give a better common life, a better. Uh, position to the whole society. Well, this is, I think it makes sense. Um, yeah, just to add to that, so generally Western governments don't want to interfere in the market, but there are some ways that, that they can help often cooperatives. In Belgium, for instance, if you buy an electric vehicle and you share it, you get a tax break. And that's something that has been helping this uh, 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 platform cooperative, Partago, in getting users actually motivated beyond their identity appeal. Thanks. Really, really interesting. Uh, if there are questions, you raise your hand. If not, uh, I have a long list of questions, so don't worry. Uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes. Um, second one that really touches on, uh, on an issue that I'm particularly sensitive at, which is that of the, of the ownership of data and the, what companies do with our data and the potential of this data to be used. Hmm? We have this new law that was uh, passed in May 2018, which is the EU GDPR, that gives some principles on transparency, aiming at something like data portability. And here I see a huge potential simply to develop uh, the law and transform this data into, in a way, rights. By, mean, by this I mean 
that if as a courier I can handle all this data and move it to a different platform, as the law in a way uh, allows us to do, or at least in principle this is part of it, it could help, uh, hopefully solve some of these problems of, of lack of transparency and precariousness, because I could make use of this data to simply show I mean, my, my credentials as a good career. So uh, am I being too optimistic on this idea that GDPR can be used to indeed boost the rights of workers or not? I'm thinking particularly now in you two, Anna and, and Ricard. Whoever wants to start with this. Um, so I think this is a very good um, question. Okay. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I think that your point is valid. So um, writers should be able to access the, their data regarding their, their uh, ratings, for example, and, and for that to be portable to other companies. However, when we talk about data, at least in the platform economy, I think that we have to take into account not only, like, workers' personal data, like like uh, ratings, for example, but also the data generated by their activity. The fact that the data generated by their activity is used, and is, it's the platforms, and it's used by the platform to continue improving their business model, um, I think that's also um, indication of a labor relationship, because they're not the owners of the data they generate. This means that they are working for an, or, uh, for an organization and within the organization, the management of this organization. So I think data is going to play a very important role here as well. Well, in, in order to add something else, I think uh, sometimes the, the, the discussion about data is about if it's needed open data or uh, how to regulate this data. I think there, are, there is a, a main question of data is about uh, their governance. Uh, the governance of the data. And this is something that it makes sense when we think not about uh, uh, open data, it's about data commons. No? How, how will we manage this data? How will be the governance? This is really connected to the, to the economic model because we have discovered that uh, the economic model is linked to the governance model. Uh, as, ma uh, as open is a platform, as open uh, regarding to their governance, uh, also is open in uh, regarding the, uh, its economic model. For example, uh, projects like uh, Commons Cloud, like this, they only not, ma not focus on how to provide uh, a platform like, uh, like uh, Google with different servers uh, regarding to the data of the users. They, they also deep in the governance of this data because it's how to manage the value of this data with the, the whole perspective, uh, the, the way that we are going to develop the technology, what will be the compromise of this technology with the community, uh, and uh, uh, regarding to the, to the benefits that these uh, projects get. I think it's quite important. Yeah, and if I may add, um, for me, the data does not matter that much on an individual level. Well, it would be nice, obviously, if careers can, can have their data, but more on an aggregate level. And the biggest problem I find is that we don't have third party checking uh, what these platforms are doing. They're essentially controlling labor market entry. No one's checking. Uh, so, for instance, I have a data uh, of uh, forum uberpeople.net, which is the biggest forum where Uber drivers talk to one another. I crawled the entire forum, scraped the data, ended up with 120,000 posts of what Uber drivers say about Uber. <laughs> and I've seen drivers saying things such as, a passenger came into my car and said they paid surge pricing, but Uber gave me the normal pricing. Um, is Uber cheating on surge prices? Perhaps. Uber can tell a passenger there is a surge, but the driver does not know there is a surge. So there is information asymmetry. Platform has information about the travel distance, uh, the, about the distance traveled, how many miles from one, uh, from a, point A to point B. Uber has information how, what, the, what is the fee that the passenger paid. It has information what is the driver got, but there is no third party, party checking anything. Uh, and for me, this is the, the biggest problem. And in this sense, drivers are completely powerless simply because there is information asymmetry. Um, and governments are now starting to require this data sharing. Uh, but I'm not sure if there is uh, enforcement of this. And in the UK, actually, uh, Matthew Taylor of RSA was just hired to enforce this in, 
in uh, UK um, that if there is some rules or policies uh, that platforms have to uh, follow, we actually have to enforce them. And we might need some third bodies being created just for this purpose. Thank you. I have two, uh, two questions from the floor, but I welcome more contributions, obviously. Uh, first one is for Ricard Squarely. It's about, uh, the, they ask if you could provide more information about the careers that you interview, if they all work for the same platform, bit of uh, demographics, age, etc. You can ask because uh, she's also participating in the research. Yeah, well, basically, the, the, the 10. Is it working? Yep. Yes. Okay. And the 10 platform careers were um, actors in the in the mobilizing in in the moment here in Barcelona, uh, well, in Barcelona or also in other parts of the world. So basically, um, we know that these 10 participants are are people who are from a concrete profile. Yeah, we know it basically. Okay. Since you you have the mic, uh, Melissa. Um, let, let me react to your presentation. I, I was a bit, it's not that I was particularly optimistic about the, the universal basic income as a way to solve all the massive problems that are generated, at least from the societal perspective, by, by the disruption of the so-called digital economy. But in a way, what you show in your more, I would say, speculative exercise is that indeed uh, this is not going to address, even though this is basically the motto used by the big platform companies and they are pretty bombastic and this is the solution to address uh, yeah, inequality at work or this uh, even monopolies etc uh, your, your theoretical exercise shows us that indeed this is not really going to affect much however I see people coming from the left so to say that are really supportive of this uh, idea and before hearing your, your take on that um, I was a skeptical, I'm not less a skeptical now. So, so how would you explain, you have studied this, this uh, well, this, this discussion. Uh, so how, how would you s sustain or, or could explain why people particularly critical with the platform economy still validate the solution of the, of the universal basic income? People critical with the platform economy, so, so yeah, capitalist, I mean, I mean, platform there is this, at some point, this coherent voices from the right and the left, so to say. Just Why everyone uh, supports it. Yeah, and in a way, um, and, and what you say is very, yeah. very, very simple and clear. Eh? We need to curb our enthusiasm on, on yeah. um, UBI. I, I think that in part, universal basic income is being like uh, an excuse to, to, to find us a solution for a problem that is much bigger. So I think that it's it's a solution for all the parts. Like for for the right parties, no, they are they are saying, okay, this is a solution for to foster consumption, and on the other hand, they are saying, okay, this is a solution to to improve freedoms, and yeah, it can be a solution for both things. But we have to be critical, and we have to think that okay, we even in in a in a theoretical work in a master thesis, we see that. There are a lot of pitfalls of, from basic income, and that we have to be not we we don't have to see it as a okay this is the the, the solution to our problems. Instead, we have to think okay this maybe it's apart from a solution. Maybe it offers some good things, but there are also some disadvantages, and we have to to balance them in mm -hmm. order to choose what we ha want in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add any take on on this? I mean, this is a, a big big topic. Um, Last question that I got from the floor goes to, to Anna, um, a, a glad customer, we might say, someone who really liked your presentation, saying that, um, yeah, that you clarified, obviously, with uh, your, your presentation, well, the different avenues, as mentioned. Uh, there is here, uh, it's more a reflection, eh? that says that uh, the way you presented algorithms really as a source of, uh, of subordination is very a very compelling argument, so indeed it makes sense to validate your thesis. But uh, he's asking about, uh, and here perhaps we should return the question to the floor because I'm not really clear whether or not I, I understood the, the question, eh? but it says, uh, what about the consumer of the service? Uh, is it, does it prove subordination as well? I, I don't know if this is exactly the, the understanding, eh? but what about the consumer of the service? 
does it subordinate? I mean, is it a way to well to understand the whole relationship as a part of uh, yeah of a labor standard labor relation? This is my what that would be my okay. my understanding. Um, so, well, first of all, thank you for the question and for the comments. Um, I think that. Well, this is um, this is actually a very complex question. <laughs> um, there are some scholars that consider that in the platform economy, um, and I'm basically thinking about Jeremiah Spressel, um, in the platform economy, um, the functions of the employer are distributed among different agents. Um, and some is the platform, but also consumers um, tend to or sometimes uh, exercise typical functions that should correspond or that usually correspond to, to employers. So the very like common um, case that which is common for, for a lot of platforms is, is the rating system. So evaluating work, this was something uh, that usually, or this is something that usually employers do, and in this case, the evaluation of work is done by directly by clients, and this is not even supervised by the platform, and the platform is adopting um, decisions, labor decisions like firing people or, or giving them more um, more tasks based on this evaluation done by cost customers. So without, um, so I agree with this position that the typical functions of the employer are distributed among, among different agents, um, but in my opinion, um, this does not um, elude the existence of a labor relationship with the platform. So it's just the platform's decision to decide to um, externalize evaluation of, of job provision to consumers. I don't know if the question was going on, you know, on this direction, but uh, so I think that it's a fair point that consumers um, mm -hmm. also exercised some type of role as employers, that typical role as of, of, of uh, employers, but it, that it doesn't exclude the existence of a labor relationship with the platform mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. above meant for the other reasons mentioned mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes sense yep uh, there was a follow-up to this so if uh, again addressed to you and it was a, a question regarding your what, what you're thinking on on the ascetization of cognitive human uh, work meaning is my understanding of the question would be uh, is there no not a bigger proof that there is, this is actually a labor relation um, yeah, determined uh, by the by the algorithm the fact that we, we now we play with talent writers call it as you want moving them around isn't it proof of uh, labor relation yeah so some authors are also considering this so the term that some authors use is algorithmic management but also cognitive management um, and, and I think that it's it's the fact that it's effective because it is influencing it is actually influen influencing how many hours workers work when they work um, how many services they accept or they reject the fact that it's working for me it's a sign of subordination as well but in my opinion I don't think it's only necessary to focus on whether this form of management is working or not, because we can all think of companies that have labor relationships with a form of management that doesn't work. So the fact, it's not that if it's working or not, the fact that, in my opinion, is that it's a form of management, whether it's effective or not. Because some people might say, well, this algorithmic management is very effective only for full-time workers in the platform, but maybe not effective for um, workers that only work like sporadically in the platform. I actually don't care if it's effective or not. It's, it's, an, it's a new, an additional argument, but it, there are multiple employers that carry out ineffective management policies. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think this is indisputably very effective. And if you would ask Uber drivers, they love the fact that they don't have idle time like they had with traditional taxis sitting uh, by the street and waiting for a ride to be assigned to them uh, via radio call. They, they love the fact that there, there is algorithm assigning. But I think the problem is that this can be exploited by platforms. So we have seen in, in news a lot of accusations of Uber for playing psychological tr uh, tricks on drivers. So when a driver is about to log off the app, they will get a message, oh, you're just uh, one right away from uh, hitting your target goal and so on. Uh, we have accusations of Uber uh, where drivers are simply being exhausted uh, uh, from driving uh, 15 hours a day and things like that. 
Um, so the, this algorithmic management can be uh, used uh, against the driver, let's say, but there is definitely lots of benefits for it. And that's, again, where policy needs to come, right, in, in the place. So, for instance, uh, uh, Uber now kept the our driver can drive to 10. Okay, uh, so we have reached the end of the session. I thank you very much for being here, for sharing with us the insights of these four scholars and for most to you four for well, sharing with us as well your, your research. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you.